Hello and welcome back. Eddie Rodasevich, George Stoy here from the Sudoscoop.com studios. Welcome back to the Sudoscoop.com YouTube page. Josh McQuishan, as usual, down at uh, Sudoscoop HQ Houston. A, another recruiting report. A lot to get into today as uh, Oklahoma Spring Game coming up on Saturday, 1 o'clock kickoff in Norman. Not going to be the best weather, uh, but, you know, I, I don't think that that's going to, uh, you know, change any of the plans. For it the, sucks for you. It, it, it that's what I'll I was be in the press say. box. I was gonna say, so it, it I won't be complaining. Me. But it does suck for you. It's gonna be a little bit of a uh, a wet day. It sounds like in Norman on Saturday. It'll be good to get a good look, a good glimpse at some of the, uh, you know, I guess basically what they've been working on. We really haven't. We've seen a lot, but I feel like we haven't seen a whole lot. Yeah, uh, we'll be talking to Jackson Arnold as well as Danny Stutzman on Tuesday night for kind of a, uh, I guess, a final send off. I think they're kind of the the two captains, if you will, for the white and the red team or the red and the white team coming up on Saturday. So a lot to look forward to, a lot happening in the uh, transfer portal in terms of uh, college football's transfer portal opening on Tuesday, April 16th. That 15-day window is going to certainly be interesting to monitor. A couple of guys coming in this weekend already from the transfer portal. We'll get into a little bit of that here on the back end of the week when we got a lot more names, kind of getting a little bit of a decision on who's in, who's out. Uh, Hayden Bray, a, a tight end walk-on from Oklahoma, yep. already entered the portal today. Day, I don't think he's going to be the last. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I think that there'll be a few others. I though I don't know how many surprises sure. there will be. I mean, you always want to say there'll probably, you know, be maybe a couple surprises, one or two guys, but uh, I don't expect any any huge names. Seems like a lot of people it. are happy right now, right? Yes. Would that be the right way to characterize that, I guess? That's the sense I get. Now, you look at position groups, and, and you just never know. Um, you know, linebacker, they're loaded. Sure. You know, cornerback is another spot, and you just wonder, wide receiver. I mean, some of those positions where you've got so many guys, does somebody say, hey, I could go start somewhere else? That could certainly happen. But uh, in terms of guys that are expected to start and play quite a bit next year, I I haven't heard a whole lot of names. If you got a brother or maybe a, even a sister that uh, is over 6'2", 300 pounds, maybe plays defensive tackle at a uh, major Division One program and they're looking for a place, hey, maybe Oklahoma would have a spot for you. Again, men or woman. Uh, man or woman. That would be uh, very 2024 of us. We want everybody equal play. Josh, a lot to get into on the recruiting side of things. Uh, I, I think the best place to start would to go bounce all the way back to last week. Last Wednesday, Oklahoma picks up a pair of commitments. It was something that we had talked about with you on the uh, the recruiting report last week. But Trent Wilson, the four-star defensive tackle, as well as Malik Hawkins, have both committed to Oklahoma to join the 2025 class. Yeah, you know, it, it was what we anticipated happening, but it's always nice Kind of like with what George was just talking about with the portal. It's nice when things go to plan and you don't have to scramble at the last minute. So, uh, yeah, you know, with, with Malik Hawkins, I think that was probably the least surprising of the two. Uh, I think that's where a lot of people had, you know, his eventual decision ending up. I think that's what everybody kind of anticipated. But, again, Oklahoma gets a guy that I, I think has a lot of potential. I think there's a lot of room for him to grow as a player because he's still – um, raw is not the right word for it, but I think he's still kind of figuring out where his best position is, what his best kind of role is. But you look at the way Oklahoma likes to play with their corners. He's very comfortable playing off. He'll come up and play run. Like he, he'll do a lot of the things that when you talk about the good, you know, solid Brent Venables corners, he'll do those things. So, I, you know, I, I'm interested to see where his ceiling is, but I definitely think he is a quality, um, a quality player that can add some things to Oklahoma and 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 be a good addition to the 85 man roster. What about uh, Trent Wilson? Obviously, this is a uh, a major win for Todd Bates. I don't know if there's any other way to say it, and especially when you're talking about uh, rebounding or not even rebounding, but continuing what they were able to do in 2024. I think that's been uh, talked about ad nauseum uh, in terms of what those guys have brought to the program already this spring. But uh, continued success on the defensive line, where I think it. It's going to ultimately be very, very important moving forward. Yeah, and what I like about this is, you know, we talk about it a lot at receiver, where you want different body types, different skill sets, those kind of things. Trent Wilson's kind of unique compared to some of the other guys in Oklahoma's roster. He's he's not as big and as long as David Stone. He's not as kind of stocky and powerful as Jaden Jackson, but he's going to come up kind of – I almost liken him uh, to like a bigger Grayson Halton, kind of, kind of same idea, you know, same kind of ways 
that he's going to win, I think, in the college game. It's kind of what Grayson does. A lot of athleticism, a lot of hands. Like, I, I think he can be a very good technical player. Um, so, again, I, I really like this addition. And like you said, Eddie, this is how you build your defensive line room. Because you've got you guys we know in the SEC, you're just rotating bodies, rotating bodies. And they they need guys to where they can throw out their two, you know, their second team and even some third team guys at times. And you can feel like, you know, maybe this guy's not going to be the all American we have starting, but he's a plenty good player that can get us snaps and get us reps. And I think Wilson is better than that last <laughs> description. I don't want people to get uh, to misunderstand, but I'm just saying, this is how you do that. And you hope you have young guys that are coming along and developing behind whoever your starters may be. Josh, I just quickly wanted to ask you, a lot of the talk right now is, can Jaden Jackson and David Stone play as soon as next year? I mean, there's even been talk about, could Jaden Jackson end up being a starter or David Stone? Is Trent Wilson a guy that you think can play as a true freshman? I know that's a long ways away. I, I Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, th thanks, George. I mean, we're waiting for him to finish his, <laughs> you know, junior year of high school. But, yeah, let, let's put him in there. Uh, no, but, but with Trent, I do. Because kind of like what I was saying, I see him as a guy that is kind of like, you know, you talk about a receiver that's a great route runner. I think Trent Wilson's very good with how he uses his hands. Wise is a good program, well coached. Uh, they win state championships uh, almost yearly. They're, they're, it's, a, it's a very good program on the East Coast. So I, I think he is a guy that will come in pretty well versed. Um, there's a lot to learn. And obviously, like I said, I think it's going to be more about how does he add weight? How What is his strength like? But if he can hold up to that stuff, I think he is a guy that will surprise people with how quickly he can kind of advance. Oh, you know, I don't want to say it because Jaden Jackson is ahead of where I would have Trent Wilson as far as how you contribute early, but I do think it's kind of that same idea of this is a very advanced uh, player from a mental perspective. Like I think he understands the game better than a lot of freshmen might. Never bad to get into, uh, you know, Upper Marlboro, Maryland either. I, I think that that is a place that uh, Oklahoma has obviously been successful. If I remember correctly, same area as Jalil Farouk. It was the same high school, wasn't it? Yep. Exact same high school. So yeah, it's a place Oklahoma is familiar with and, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, again, guys, I, I don't think there's an area that has more, you know, I, I don't know if it's it's not per capita, but you talk about a lot of boom guys like that really take off and have great careers. That DMV area in general, you're going to find a lot of hits in there. No doubt. Never saw Baron Trump's name, but I think he's out of Florida. 13 commitments in the 2025 class up to 11th, or I guess it would be down to 11th. They have dropped two spots, uh, depending on when was the last time that you checked it. Oklahoma, 11th ranked uh, recruiting class in the country with 13 commitments, sixth overall in the SEC. That's the good. Let's get into a little bit of uh, what could be viewed as the bad. I think that uh, it had been long rumored, but uh, Nate Roberts, 2025 Oklahoma, uh, Washington, Oklahoma tight end, the brother of Jake Roberts, announces his commitment over the weekend to Ohio State, Josh, and uh, you know, I, I don't think that this blindsided anybody by any means, but I would say that, uh, you know, for the people that uh, definitely were upset about it online, is there any reprieve in that it is a, maybe, you know, is it a long way away from uh, signing? Does Oklahoma, do they still have a foot in the door? Are they still going to recruit uh, Nate Roberts? And uh, just kind of overall your thoughts on uh, the announcement. Uh, you know, it, it's an interesting deal because I had, about two months ago, I had kind of started to say, look, guys, I think if a Nate made the announcement right now, it would be Ohio State. Does that mean that I think he'll sign there? No. That, that, and that was kind of where I, where I had left it. And I don't know if I still feel that way, because, but the, I think a little bit of that is going to be how do Roberts know you kind of handle this going forward? Because we know he's going to be on campus. We sure. know he's going to come watch his brother, Jake. We know all those things are going to happen. So I think Oklahoma can kind of play this cool and just say, we're going to put the ball in your court. You know, we're still here. You know, we're still interested and, and let him kind of dictate the terms and just let him, you know, kind of do what he will. Because the nice situation for Oklahoma here is they have CJ Nixon and Dakota Terrell, both in state guys as well that are both fully capable of growing in and, you know, being tight ends. And in my personal opinion, I think CJ Nixon is better destined as a tight end. I think yeah. he's a better fit there. 
And I think he's more comfortable there. And you and I have talked about that before, Eddie. So, um, you know, I think that's an interesting possibility. And with the emergence of Dakota Terrell, does that allow Oklahoma to kind of say, hey, CJ, would you be interested in that? Do you think maybe that could fit you? And the other aspect of this is, and again, this is what we get into when you just start recruiting big, talented athletes. Alexander Shield Knight, the, the defensive end Oklahoma has committed, Arkansas was recruiting him as a tight end, and he was pretty open to that. I think that's one of the reasons he really liked what Arkansas was pitching him on. So let's say Oklahoma lands Terrell, lands Nixon, and maybe even Aragbo Smith, who um, I you know I had some news up on the board last night, has set up his official visit for the Champion Barbecue, big uh, number 26 overall player in the country out of Houston. You land all three of those guys, do you go back to Alex Shield Knight and say, Hey man, would you, you know, this tight end seem interesting to you? You, we, we could open that door for one of you guys. And I, so I think Oklahoma has some flexibility here and can it, this, I, you know, don't get me wrong. It's kind of the glass half full look at it, sure. but I do think they, they're given some flexibility now that they don't have to hold this spot for Nate Roberts and say, he's, you know, he's a tight end in this class for us that we want. Now they can kind of shuffle the deck a little bit if they want to. Josh, let me ask you this, and this might be an odd question to ask, but how important is it that Jake Roberts and, and really that tight end room for Oklahoma kind of have a big year in terms of how – because, I mean, you watch how they used – we talked about it a ton of times with Austin Stogner last year. It just wasn't a huge factor. But let's say Jake Roberts goes out and has a, a big season this year and has you know 400 yards receiving, 500 yards receiving, several touchdowns. Like, could that play a role? Not, I mean, not only in Nate Roberts. I mean, that would be huge yeah. for his recruitment, but maybe other tight ends and where they're recruiting those guys. I don't think there's any question, guys. I mean, like, and that's part of it too. I, I was having this conversation with somebody. It's kind of an aside, but I, I was a parent of a recruit, and we were talking about kind of the ways that Oklahoma recruits, the way they present their information. It's very you know, like family, soul mission, like a lot of that. But there are a lot of schools that do a lot more to say, hey, look at what we're doing in the NFL. Look at our production. Look at all the money our guys are making. And then, you know, you look at Oklahoma and it was it, it was almost like they're too humble about it was kind of the impression I got. And it, it's something I've heard before, but, you know, I was kind of having a very direct conversation about that aspect. And so you wonder if, if something like that happens, is Oklahoma going to take advantage of it? With with Nate Roberts, like you said, you know, George, that's super easy. They don't even have to pitch it. Like, obviously, Jake's going to know what, uh, excuse me, Nate's going to know what Jake does every week. So if he's having a huge year, it's going to resonate. But for other guys, I, I, I'm interested to see, can Oklahoma pivot to that sometimes and say, hey, look, this is what we're doing? Because guys, we know, like, say whatever you want to about Oklahoma's tight end production. Ohio State is not putting uh, – they haven't had a Mark Andrews player in a long time. I mean, you can say Mark Andrews a long time ago. Ohio State doesn't even have that track record. So some of this comes down to what you're presenting, how you're recruiting, how you're pitching it. Um, and so I, I think that is part of the equation too. But, yeah, if you could have – and it would especially be helpful, like you said, if it's a guy like Jake – or Bauer Sharp or someone like that. If it's Devon Mitchell, <laughs> the reverse is very well going to be true because people are going to say, I don't want to play behind, or I'm not going to play behind that monster anytime soon. So I, I think that that's that fine line you have to walk. But yeah, it, it absolutely is something guys watch if Oklahoma chooses to use it. Should be interesting to watch, and especially with, uh, you know, Nate still having to go through a senior season and obviously the ties back into Norman. It will be something that, uh, you know, if he was a kid from, California or whatever I think that maybe you just write it off but because it is kind of in your own backyard it's going to be something uh, very very uh, you know I, I don't know about fun I don't know if I would categorize it as fun but it will be something to watch here moving forward when we were out at practice uh, last Friday uh, it was hard uh, to, to miss him because we were standing over there with the offensive lineman quite a bit and that is uh, 2025 five-star offensive lineman, Michael Fasusi, somebody that you had talked to and you have the story up on Suterscoop.com right now, Josh. It sounds like uh, that was a very, very good visit for what it was. Yeah, and, you know, Eddie, the, the thing I like about Mike is, and, and, you know, he did it in the interview when you and I talked to him at Under Armour. He, he did it again when we spoke on Saturday. Um, it was very 
Like people will read that and say, oh, he's just telling you what you want to hear. There's parts of that conversation where Mike's like, ah, that, you know, like this wasn't perfect. This wasn't, you know, but like, then he'll talk about other stuff that he really does love. And that's, I know people will see the negative and be like, oh, it's bad. But to me, I just take that as the stuff he likes. He really does like, like, he's not just giving you the lip service of, oh, this visit was great. And this was amazing. What I thought was really interesting. And I don't have a lot of parallels to this, but at the same time, I would say there's not a lot of comparison for it either. Is Jaden Hardy sitting in on his meeting with Brent Venables? Like Jaden was in the room and they're having the conversation and those kind of things. And I'm not saying it was a big, heavy conversation, but usually, you know, it's it's whoever the player is with, you know, mom, dad, coach, whatever it may be, and Brent Venables. And, you know, in this case, it was, you know, also Jaden Hardy. And I knew they were friends, but listening to Mike talk about, you know, he's a guy I look up to. Like I go to him, I ask him a lot of recruiting questions. He he's really helped me through the process. You're like, that's more meaningful than maybe I gave it credit for at certain times. So again, Oklahoma, this is this is absolutely gonna be a dog fight. Um, Texas, Texas AM. I think Mike's he kind of hinted at it that maybe he's getting uh, maybe it won't be a top seven much longer for him. Maybe he gets it down to four or five or something along those lines. But to me, there's, there's no question that Oklahoma will make whatever the next cut is. And then we're just going to have to kind of see, but there, there I, again, I, and I know we can go into whatever questions you guys have, but I, I, I did, I thought a lot of his comments in that article were really kind of telling um, about the way he's kind of viewing the entire process. Josh, uh, we saw him out at practice. It was funny. Um, I was taking a picture of Daniel Akinkumi, who was on a scooter and hurt. And I was like, that's a big guy next to him. And it was Michael Fasusi. Yeah. It's um, hard to miss. But I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned a little bit, how much does it help? I mean, I, I know you mentioned here in the article about him talking to Daniel Akinkumi and, and him kind of telling him about the program, but then also Jaden Hardy being you know former teammates. I mean, how much do you think that can actually help in his recruitment going forward, having some of those connections. I, I'm sure he has connections at some of these other schools, like you said, Texas, Texas A&M, but um, it sounds like him and Jaden Hardy and now Daniel Akinkumi are pretty close. I think it's big, and I think it's it's honestly a nice marriage between, and it sounds weird to say this, Jaden Hardy and Bill Biedenbow. Because I think with Bill Biedenbow, Michael Fasusi has maybe more confidence in his ability to turn him into an NFL player than any other coach he deals with. Like, I, and that's not something Michael said. That's me reading between the lines a little bit, but that's my impression. It's something Michael brings up all the time when he talks about Oklahoma is basically Bill turns out NFL guys and he does it, you know, over and over and over again. And with Jaden, I think it gives him the relationship and the trust. And it's not to say that Bill and Michael don't have a good relationship. They absolutely do. I just think, Michael feels very connected to Jaden Hardy and he feels like this guy's telling me OU's great and it's all he hoped it would be and all these things and I really trust that he trusts that more than he's going to trust any coach because he knows Jaden so well that you know he kind of mentioned being almost like a big brother kind of deal so I I do I I never think these things are deciding factors I I just it's usually not the way it plays out but I do think it's a really nice card for Oklahoma to have. Obviously, when he comes up for his official visit, uh, you know, he may get hosted by Daniel or somebody like that, but you know Jaden's going to be there on his hip the whole time. Like they, that, They're, they're going to make sure that he is as comfortable as he can be. It's all going really well. So I, I think it definitely has a role, but I don't want anybody to get false hope and say, oh, this is, this is the thing that unlocks – this whole recruitment, Josh. You mentioned you mentioned the development too. I wanted to ask you about that too. The you 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 asked him straight up about NIL and the importance of that in his recruitment, and clearly that's going to play a factor in, in every recruitment. But it does seem like he he really values the development side and wanting to get to the NFL, and he knows that's where the real money can be made, and he feels like Beatenbo can can help him do that. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things about. Michael knowing that he is an extremely talented guy. Like some guys can say, Oh, I, I want to go to the NFL. I believe I have that opportunity. You know, that kind of thing. Michael knows his physical traits are unusual. 
And if he is well coached and he does all the things he's supposed to do and, you know, barring the unforeseen, he should be on that trajectory. Like, I think we can all say that pretty reasonably. So to me, he is more apt and more able to say, okay, maybe I don't need that extra X hundred thousand dollars, whatever it may be. If I can go somewhere, I'm going to be a first round pick. Like, I think that just makes things much easier as compared to a guy that's thinking, this may be my only payday. This may be my only opportunity. So again, you know, if it's Oklahoma or anywhere else, they've got to be competitive. I mean, he was clear, like he wants to help his family. He wants to, you know, be able to give something back to them while he's playing college ball. But at the same time, he also recognizes that the big money is at the next level. Like, so this is about, you know, having enough, being able to, you know, whatever it may be, you know, take this bill off a of mom's hands or, you know, whatever that thing is, but being able to help and then hopefully, you know, go where he wants to go and then buy mom a new house. Like, I, I think that's, that's kind of where his head is at. So I, I do, I thought he gave a really interesting answer on NIL and I, I thought it was um, something that I, I thought should really buoy OU fans that maybe had felt like, oh, this guy's kind of slipping away. I, there is a very clear avenue where what he's describing can work for OU. It's good news, obviously. We'll have a little bit more on the 2025 offensive linemen. Uh, we'll need to get into a little bit of the ranking updates. We'll do that here on the back end of uh, today's program because I do want to slide into a couple other guys that have visited campus here over the last couple of weeks, starting with uh, a name in the 2026 class that it seems like is maybe taking the uh, the top spot when you're talking about the quarterback uh, power rankings or whatever you want to call them inside the Oklahoma football offices. Darion Coleman a uh, 2026 quarterback out of Lakeland, Florida, Jones High School. Uh, certainly seems like that could be the name when you're talking about 2026 Oklahoma quarterback recruiting. And I know I, I want to start with this with something mundane, but we we got to clarify because oh, I know God. there's at I least... It, I said his name wrong, uh, didn't uh, but I? At least, no, no, no. Oh. At least 20 people in Florida will be like, there's no Jones High School in Lakeland. Oh, we boy. know, we know. I believe he is from Lakeland and plays at Orlando Jones. So, Orlando Jones. Uh, okay. or, yeah. So, again, that that's just the way on three's database is built out. We usually put where they actually live and then go forward with whatever high school they're at. So, no need to yell at us. We're well aware. But uh, as far as the importance of Darian Coleman comes in, he's told me since the day Oklahoma offered him, that's my dream school. That That's where I always wanted to go. Um, I had heard some stuff probably a month or two ago that he was really, really high on Oklahoma, you know, was almost like, you know, everybody was like, Hey, just, just take your time. Let, let's see what else is going on here. Let, let, let's make sure everything's where it needed to be. But he came in. I think everybody got along. It, it, it kind of clicks for everybody. I went ahead and put in a forecast. Uh, I keep doing it. I put in a prediction for him uh, with on three, and I know Steve Wiltfong did as well. He and I had discussed that a little bit. I, I think Oklahoma's going to be really tough to beat, and speaking to him afterward, it was just kind of like, uh, yeah, I'm going to probably pretty soon here just start focusing on spring football and getting ready, and then I can't wait to get back out to Oklahoma. So, you know, you all can read that however you want to. I, I think Oklahoma's in really good shape here. Uh, he's expected to announce on July 3rd, so, hey, we don't have to work on the 4th of July for, you know, for a decision here. Uh, so that's nice. But, yeah, I, I think Oklahoma's in really good shape. Are we already at a point where, and this is probably going to date me, and I've already felt like a uh, a very, very old man today with the uh, news of Blake Griffin's retirement from uh, the NBA, but are we already at a point where you're talking to kids and they're saying, yeah, I grew up watching Baker Mayfield play football at Oklahoma. I grew up watching Kyler Murray play football. Like, how does somebody that grew up in Florida – end up as Oklahoma as their dream school, Josh. And I do want to ask about him as the play as a player. Yeah. And that is Eddie. I mean, I think it's the track record of Ugh. quarterbacks. You know, you just, th there's nobody that's had anything like what OU's done. I, I don't, I, I would say in the history of college football, probably nothing like what OU's done over the last 25 years at the quarterback position with from Josh Heupel to, you know, Caleb Williams, uh, you just go to, I mean, Dylan Gabriel would be a, a Hallmark player for a lot of programs and for Oklahoma, 
OU fans had to wrestle with how they felt about him for most of his career. So, um, you know, th- that is that that's just indicative. And, and obviously, you guys know these things. But I think for players, even though so much of what made, you know, what was around when those players were there is no longer there, it's kind of like what we talk, you know, I, we were talking about something yesterday with Oklahoma or with Alabama, you know, and how that really. People just kind of look at Alabama and say, oh, yeah, you know, it's it's still Alabama. Well, it's not, but that name carries so much weight for quarterbacks. That I, and I do. I, I think it does, and it certainly doesn't hurt that, you know, Darion's a guy, like I said, living in Lakeland, Florida, not far from Tampa Bay, and sees sure. all the success and sees Baker take him to the playoffs. So those things certainly don't hurt. And, you know, so, I, again, I do. I, I think that is – a big part of it. But I think also it's just, if you want to play quarterback, Oklahoma is a school you look at. And I think that's the way a lot of guys look at this. And obviously OU fans will hope Jackson Arnold can kind of pick up that torch and, and be the next guy. Josh, what kind of uh, what kind of quarterback is he? Um, I know Eddie wanted to ask that. And I also yeah. want to ask too about Seth Luttrell <laughs> and in this part of their recruitment, because what kind of quarterbacks, this is the first time we've seen him kind of recruiting this position for OU what kind of quarterback is he after? And does, does I'm guessing Coleman fits whatever mold that is. Yeah, I, I would say the clear prerequisite for Seth Luttrell is you have to have some ability to move your feet. Like the, these are, he hasn't offered a statue yet. All these guys can move around. Now, some, you know, like you, you go from Legend Bay, who is just like a slot receiver almost playing quarterback. Like he's just, so, and I don't mean that as a slight to his ability throwing the ball, just like he is so athletic running and then you've got guys that are more prototypical but they still can move I mean like I I would say and you know no offense to Eddie or Sam but the low end of the athletic tree is kind of like a Sam Bradford guy clearly can run clearly can move but isn't you know Michael Vick and then you've got some of these guys like Darion Coleman who can really run Darion Coleman's a guy that you give him 10 he can make it 30 like he he has that kind of ability but at the same time, you watch him. This is a kid that has some refinement to his game. He's not just a guy that throws vertical all the time or you know the nine route or anything like that. He does a lot of different stuff on his tape and I think shows some pretty good accuracy. I, I, I really do. I think there's a lot to build on here. And I think this is a situation where Oklahoma saw him early, knew they liked him, had a chance you know, to really make a run. And so I, I think they're just kind of going with it. But I think this is a guy that people will say, oh, you know, I think – on um, on three industry rankings, he's like a top two fifty guy in the country. I think you'll see him climb over time, just because guys with his physical traits, th- those are those are really hard to defend and deal with. And there's something that I know the on three rankings guys value, and as they see more and more of them and have more exposure, I think his his profile will grow. Staying on the 2026 side of things, another. Uh player and prospect and now I guess target for Oklahoma an offer in Javari Flowers that uh, reported also knows Jaden Hardy it sounds like Jaden Hardy might be one of Oklahoma's best recruiters Jaden Hardy he is one of those guys that so he went to IMG for a while and then he came back and somehow in like a month in Florida he knows everybody in the state of Florida I don't know how that happened I can't explain it but Jaden you know and I, we talked about this I want to say when I came back from the Under Armour All-American game where I saw him down there and he knew, obviously knew all the OU guys, but he he was one of those guys like he knew everybody and very much um, unlike, you know, like I, I would say like a guy like Buki a few years ago. Buki knew everybody, but like it was so obvious. Like he, he was, oh, you know, glad hand and talking to everybody. Jaden Hardy almost feels like the godfather. Like people roll up to him and like shake his hand and like, you know, like it, I don't know. It, it, it's a weird thing and I can't really put my hand on it. I'm certainly not saying Jaden Hardy has a violent past. I'm just saying that like he has that thing where people kind of come up to him. They kind of gravitate toward him. And it, it's, it's really interesting to watch. And like I said, it helps that he's spent his years at either IMG or in the North Dallas area where Oklahoma recruits a ton. So there is a lot of overlap where the, a lot of these guys know each other. And Javari Flowers mentioned him. And, you know, Javari said in the in the write-up we've got up on the side, he called it his best visit ever. He, he, he loved his time at OU. And uh, it's early for him. Like you said, he's a 2026 guy. But 
he's a top 100 player in the country and you know was already talking about when he was going to get back there's been a lot of people coming into the Sooner State here over the course of spring, obviously making visits to Oklahoma uh, to practice, things like that, recruit. Uh, we also had director of uh, national recruiting. Chad Simmons is in uh, the Sooner State here over the past week, stopping in on a number of guys that I think people will be rather familiar with when you're talking about 2025 uh, four-star athlete, C.J. Nixon uh, Nickens, who you just spoke of Josh at the beginning of the program. Uh, Kaden Jones, who I think has impressed just about everybody uh, when they're able to see him. The 2026 running back quarterback out of uh, Jinx, Oklahoma. I'm going to throw in cornerback just to uh, appease Coach Gaylor up at Jinx. As well as uh, a Wasso four-star defensive tackle, Taj Overton, who uh, was down, I believe, for the was it the Heisman Hangout. Made a trip down to Dorman uh, here recently. Uh, somebody that you had talked about we're getting rather close to possibly making a prediction with as well. Um, anything stick out to you? If, have you talked to Chad here over the course of uh, his time in the Sooner State? I was a little bit disappointed that we weren't able to give him any uh, severe weather on uh, Monday night as well. Yeah, uh, Chad, uh, my favorite thing that Chad tweeted out, and this will disappoint, you know, recruiting fans, was the weather change from uh, Monday night to Tuesday morning. I was like, welcome to Oklahoma, man. Yeah. Like that, that's the, that is the way of the world here. But, um, yeah, you know, Chad went and saw C.J. Nixon out in Weatherford. What I thought was interesting in that interview is C.J.'s a guy, like, he'll – Kind of get back, like he's tough to get a hold of. Like he doesn't talk a lot, and so when I when I'll talk to him, and he was asking, uh, Chad asked him how many times he'd been to Oklahoma, and I'm thinking in my head I know this answer. I'm like, hey, you know, five, six. He's like seven, eight, nine. I'm like, okay, he's been there even more than I realize he has been there, and then you know it's kind of like, well, where else have you been? Ah! not really anywhere so I, I again I, I think everybody just needs to be patient with CJ Nixon let him go through this process I think Oklahoma is in outstanding shape Caden Jones Oklahoma legacy um, I I'd still really really like where Oklahoma is he should be back on campus this weekend for the spring game uh, and then you mentioned Taj Overton a guy that honestly I just kind of keep waiting for that one thing, that one bit of information to kind of push me over the edge. But again, I, I, I God, I sound like a massive homer here, but this is, I, I think Oklahoma's in great shape there as well. And, you know, we talk about it all the time. When your state is producing defensive line and, uh, you know, of this caliber, of this kind of quality, you got to keep, you got to keep those guys in state. And it looks like Oklahoma's in a really good position to do that with Taj Overton. It's all rather positive. We hit you with the bat earlier with the Nate Roberts news. We'll give you a little mm -hmm. bit more positive. Uh, there is some other positive news as uh, the 2025 on 300 rankings have been updated. And one of the biggest movers in the country is one of Oklahoma's most recent commitments in Marcus Wimberly. That was expected, Josh. Uh, did that, did that, I guess, did that jump? Uh, was it about what you thought it was going to be, or is that thing, uh, could he get even higher, I guess, is uh, my question in terms of uh, Marcus Wimberly. I know that we were super impressed with him when we saw him at the uh, UA camp down in Arlington. Yeah, and we, <laughs> we took some heat in the YouTube comments because I said something about him at the time of his commitment where OU loves him that he's a football player. And I said, you know, the previous staff, it would have had to be, oh, he has to be 6'2 and 210 and runs 4'4 and that kind of stuff. Somebody was like, well, Josh, didn't he go to Under Armour? And he was like 6'1, 195 and ran 4'4'7. I'm like, yeah, you got a point. Like, <laughs> you, you, you really do. So, I, you know, I don't, I, I'll, I'll own that I, I, I made that sound worse than it was. But, um, yeah, Marcus, uh, again, Eddie, I, I think the thing that stood out to me when I saw him, and, and Under Armour was the first time I got to see him in person, he is a big guy. Like, you, you don't really expect him to, especially, like, through the lower body, you're like, that's a powerful dude. You're like, he, he'll take on, you know, a, a running back in a lane. You know, he's not going to have any problems with any of that. And I, he's just more well put together than you expected kind of a small-town Arkansas guy to be. But, you know, his dad, you know, helps him and coaches him and does all that stuff. So, like, there's a lot that that does make sense to that. But he is – I think he's worth the move. I, I loved his tape the first time I saw it. Plays – and what's amazing, Eddie, is when you watch his tape, this is a guy that plays a lot of quarterback for box side. He doesn't spend a ton of time, at least on the tape I've seen, 
at on defense because they just can't risk him. He's their quarterback. He, you know, he kind of a, a zone read type of guy. And so they've got to be real careful with him taking an injury on the defensive side of the ball and then being lost on offense. So all that we saw is, you know, like he's worked on it, he's trained on it, but he doesn't have as many reps as some of these guys sure. in actual games. So I, I think that's really interesting to still see how far he can grow. Um, but yeah, I, again, I, he was to me well worth the moving. I think he could maybe move up a little bit more, but I, I, I thought this was a pretty good, pretty on the nose ranking from on three with this latest update. Certainly one of the biggest jumps in the country. Another guy and another guy in the Oklahoma 2025 class that has uh, made a jump, an already uh, committed player and Ryan Foji moving from number 161 overall to uh, top 70 in the country. Now checking in at 65. Yeah, last I, the only reason I acknowledged the Marcus Wimberly height weight thing was so that I could kind of tell everybody I told you so about Ryan Foje and seem still sort of humble about it. Um, but Ryan Foje, like, again, this is a guy, when I saw him last summer at OU's camp, you're like, okay, he's interesting. I kind of like what I saw. And then I went to see them uh, in the season. Uh, Bridgeland is the high school he plays for up in Cyprus. And... I really wanted to, I, I was really going to see John Tay Newman primarily, but also Ryan Foje because OU had offered him shortly there before, but I, I kind of wasn't sure what that offer meant, what that, you know, how serious OU was. I started watching him through warmups and I'm like, I think this guy may be the better player. Like I just watching his movement skills. So, somebody kind of asked me, where does he fall, you know, within like Ty Haywood and Michael Fasusi? I could make the case that he's kind of the combination of the two. He's a little longer than Fasusi is, a little bit, um, uh, a little taller, more of kind of a pro, you know prototypical left tackle. But at the same time, I think he moves a little more explosively, a little more fluidly, like Fasusi does compared to Haywood. So I'm not saying he's better than both or anything like that. I'm just saying he's kind of a mixture of the two. And again, guys, I. If you told me at the end of all this, he's in the top 40, I wouldn't be shocked at all. I think Ryan Foje is super, super talented and I think alleviate some of that pressure that Oklahoma knows is there to land some elite offensive tackles because I think they've already got one. You already mentioned Ty Haywood. Let's, uh, let's just get into that real quick like. Uh, he did pick up his fifth star. He moves from uh, number 12 to number eight in the on three uh, rankings. Just simply put, one of the best offensive tackles in the country. Yeah, I mean, I mean, is, just it, is, it, big, as that, is it that easy when talking yeah. about Ty Haywood? Well, and I think what's so impressive, guys, is when you look at this offensive tackle class, I mean, you you go back a year, Michael Fasusi is the number one offensive tackle maybe in the country last year. Uh, Ty Haywood certainly is. Um, you know, Andrew Babalola, you go down the list, all these guys OU is in on. Broderick Scholl from Bixby, I think would have, like, by our rankings right now, would have been number two or number three in the country at offensive tackle. Like, it's it's just an insanely good year at the position. And particularly, as we keep talking about regionally here, Kansas, Texas, Oklahoma, there's good ones all through the area. So, again, but with Ty Haywood, it's so much potential there. He's so big. I Again, with that video that I always come back to last year with him, you know, faking the fall – like he's so big, I feel like it makes a sound. Even when you watch the video, like you can hear him falling. He's a big kid, but I, again, I I think of all the, you know, Andrew Babalola, Michael Fasusi, Ty Haywood, Lamont Rogers. Ty Haywood's the one I think Oklahoma's in the best shape with right now. I, I really like where they are. I think they've done a really good job. I Alabama's going to be interesting to see how hard they push on Ty Haywood because I know that's a school he grew up liking a lot, kind of like we talked about earlier with Darian Coleman in Oklahoma. Um, so that's – we know Alabama's a big hill to climb. It always is. But with Ty Haywood being at, at Denton Ryan, Oklahoma having a lot of success in Denton ISD lately, I think there's reason to believe. And, again – uh, you know, telling OU fans they could land the number eight player in the country who is an offensive tackle. I, I don't know how OU fans wouldn't get excited about that. This is a guy that could be, you know, a maybe redshirt him for a year and then he's a two, three year starter at left tackle, like and and could potentially be a an all American type player. It's crazy looking at the rankings here and, and seeing Ty Haywood at eight. 
uh, Fasusi's up to 32, and then obviously Ryan Foggia at 65. I mean, you're talking about if OU could somehow land all three of those Not guys. Not to mention Andrew Babaloa, who jumped up to 14, 14 as well. I mean, you're 15, so mm-hmm. it wasn't that big of a jump. If they could land three of those guys, I mean, you're talking about, what, Josh, maybe the best offensive line class in some time. Yeah, George, they could sign you and I to play guard, and that's still a really good offensive <laughs> line class. Like that, you know, like the, the, you're in great shape there. And again, that's that's the whole need here. Like they they've got Owen Hollenbeck, they've got their center. Like I said, Ryan Foje. At the time, people were like, "Well, OU's," because I, I remember, guys, we talked about it. There were all these people on the Crimson Corner that were like, "Why are they taking this guy right now, Josh? When all these other guys right here, he's going to take a spot away from." from Lamont Rogers or whoever it may be. And I'm like, guys, he's really good. Like, just, just wait. And now everybody's like, oh yeah, that was a great take. You know, like it just, it, it's one of those things where Bill did a really nice eval, knew he liked the kid, knew he wanted the guy, went out and got him. And now everybody's kind of catching up to, holy crap, this guy's really, really good. And I, again, I know we're, I, I, we're the highest on Foje, but I think 24 seven has him as a top 100 player in the country as well. And he'll only move up as other evaluators see more and more of him. But, um, it, it is, it, it's crazy how that narrative changed because this time last year, Jonte Newman was the guy and Foje was kind of the afterthought and that's no shot at F- Newman. He's a good player too. It's just Foje is rapidly improving and i think his stock is just going to keep climbing speaking of somebody that uh, saw his stock climb a little bit in this latest uh, update another oklahoma commit in elijah thomas the wide receiver out of shakota oklahoma it goes from 216 to 172 and I, I think it's become pretty known how we feel about him josh i mean is this a guy that could end up could he make another big jump after his senior season you think I think it's possible. Now, it is – there's no question. It's tougher for him because at no point in his season is he likely to face a Division One player. Sure. Like, I mean, and I don't mean, you know, a corner opposite him. There may not be one on the field <laughs> with him at any time this year. Right. And that's just the way it goes. And people, you know, right or wrong, will knock him for that. And they'll be kind of, like, oh, you know, what's he facing? But we watched him in Dallas, Eddie. I mean, he took on a bunch of Division One corners or a bunch he, of guys with Division One offers. There, obviously, took him home with and, MVP. And, but. Yeah, and he, he had no problem. And, I, again, I, I think that's just one of those deals where especially kind of like what I talked about with Marcus Wimberly, Elijah's kind of the same way. Like, you don't realize how big he is until you kind of get next to him, and you're like, wow, he, you know, and uh, like big, like, almost like running back legs. Like he's real thick through the lower body, but he's long armed. And like, it's just, there's a lot. I, I, again, I'm a huge fan. I I've kind of made the comparison to like a, like a CD lamb light kind of, again, I'm not saying he's that guy, but he's not terribly far off. There's a lot of similar skill set, And, um, I, again, I'm a huge fan that I, I 100% think, whether he ends up there or not, I think he is a top 100 talent in the country. I think Elijah Thomas is really special. And for me, and I, I've still, I keep saying it week over week, I'm going to get the state rankings out here sometime soon. I can almost guarantee you he will be my number one player in the state. He's going to be special. It's going to be a lot of fun. It, it it will make that drive out to Shakota, whether you're coming up all the way from Houston or whether I'm driving out I-40 East. It, I think just getting there and being able to see the numbers that he's going to put up this season He's going to have a fantastic year. I I don't think there's any doubt about that. Last but not least, Josh, Oklahoma spring game coming up this weekend. Obviously, there is going to be a big visitor list. Is there anybody that you really have circled that go, okay, it's interesting that he's making this move or he's making the trip to Norman this weekend? Is there anybody that would kind of fit that bill? The one that is probably interesting, and I need to make sure that he is still coming, but as of – like mid March, this was the plan. Was Faison Brandon the uh, the number the quarterback that I believe we have as the number twelve overall player in the country in the twenty twenty six class? He's expected to be there. This is a guy from North Carolina. His team actually, if I am not mistaken, knocked out. Um, oh, the the pitcher linebacker James, James Nesta. Nesta. Just sorry, just went blank on James's name for a second there. They knocked their team out of the playoffs last year. This is a like I said, one of the top three or four quarterbacks in the country in the 2026 class. Uh, he is expected to be there. I don't know of anything that's changed. I don't know why it would have. But as far as I know, he is expected to be there. And again, 
So you throw him. Jaden O'Neal was here earlier, you know, in the month. There is a there's a lot happening at Oklahoma's 2026 quarterback. A uh, you know how that that's going to work out. So I think that's that's really interesting. And the other one that I would say that you know, hey, if you're kind of watching for something, Cortland Guillory is has talked for a while about coming up this weekend. And I know when I spoke to him following the Heisman hangout. He loved that visit. He had a great time. I think it's pretty clear Oklahoma sticks out for him a little bit. Um, so if that if he makes that trip, maybe something happens because we know cornerback recruiting is getting down to tight as far as numbers with the decision of Malik Hawkins. So th- those are a couple names I might watch. And again, this list is going to get bigger and bigger. I'm hoping to have my first real you know rough draft of what the what the visit list is going to look like probably in tomorrow's woke. There is a a ton to get into uh, or a ton to develop here as, you know, I think that we're going to be keeping our eye on the portal here over the next couple of days. We'll have a uh, show here at the end of the week, just in terms of everything that's going on, all the kind of the names to know. I know that George, uh, George, you already wrote about it today, just in terms of uh, the needs for Oklahoma and all that kind of stuff. So, Josh, we appreciate it. We will uh, catch you later on the other side with uh, another recruiting report and of course if anything uh, you know breaks we'll be right here on suterscoop.com youtube channel for george josh i'm eddie we'll talk to you next time